Thank you. I plan, is this loud enough for everybody back there? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Plan to only have 20 or 30 people here. And, um, <laughs> I'm very excited to speak in front of this large crowd. And it provides a different level of stress than the stress I've been having over the last couple of months preparing for our 2014 150th anniversary <laughs> reenactment, which has been driving me crazy this last week. So it gives me a good break to get out of the office for a day and do something like this, and hopefully it'll entertain you a little bit and you'll learn something along the way too. Uh, don't let me get out of here without talking about the reenactment for a bit and some of the different books that I wrote, especially, uh, well, she's selling the Missouri's Alamo book, but I also like to talk about the one on General Sterling Price's raid, uh, just for the genealogical resources in it. I want you to look at that question. That's not the title of the talk, but I'm gonna answer that question at least as far as my opinion goes by the end of this talk. And I think it's something that you could sit back and go, hmm, over a cup of coffee and a donut. Let's see if I get this right. I also like to flip through the first several slides really, really, really fast. But anyhow, but, um, we're gonna be talking about General Sterling Price's raid that started in September of 64. It had been planned throughout the summer after they were trying to take troops out of Arkansas to go east of the Mississippi River and fight for Lee and fight for uh, Johnston at the time. And the only way that they could keep the troops this side of the river supposedly was to have a raid or do something and the do something was let's put Sterling Price in charge of a bunch of soldiers and have them march into Missouri to hopefully liberate Missouri. The first time I gave this talk was to the Sons of Confederate Veterans group in St. Louis, and I noticed that we have a couple here tonight. And when I told the uh, person that was organizing the talk, he said, what would you want to speak about? I said, well, I want to speak about Sterling Price's raid, and he says, his comment was, well, I guess that'll be a good talk no matter how difficult the topic is for us to swallow. <laughs> and to me, I think anybody that knows me, I am not a Confederate apologist in any way, shape, or form. I'm, I really strongly side with the Union in a lot of stuff. However, Price's raid did have some successes and it was very important to <coughs> the, at least in my mind and a couple other historians' minds, the extension of the Civil War. Dave Rogensees, the site director at Fort Davidson before I came there, Bryce Sudero, who wrote the original book back in the 1960s on the raid, on the Battle of Pilot Knob, he, uh, both of us, both of them, came up with a couple different ideas of why it extended the war. And going through additional research, we've all added to that over time. And since neither one of them really wants to give this talk, I feel it's a good place for me to step in and give the talk and, and blame them for anything that somebody wants to argue about. But, uh, <laughs> but really, there are some successes that people just don't think about with this raid. And for that reason, for that reason, I think we need to reevaluate prices rate. And if you go to bookstores, especially in the last year or so, um, there are several books that are coming out talking about the rate. Um, just one of the newest ones that came across my desk that I happen to really think is well written is this where value and uh, devotion met the Battle of Pilot Knob, the authors of Major and the Military. And he did, a very good, he did a very good job of telling us his opinion of where, tactic, where Price was tactically good and where ta Price was tactically bad. We'll get into that a little bit later. There's also, uh, I believe the man's name I, skips me at the moment, but I think it was LaRousse, has written already 
a book on prices and rate that goes all the way up to Jefferson City. And I think this month he's supposed to come out with the second volume, which goes from Jefferson City back down out, in, out at the end of the uh, state of Missouri and into Arkansas. Well, yeah. Could you move the mic up? The back row is. Can't hear me? Okay. Stay behind the speakers, too. That would be the house of reverb. Stay behind what? Safe. Okay. <laughs> I'll stay back here. <laughs> We're going to corner you. Uh, in fact, I will move back just a little bit to make sure I'm behind the speakers. So there, there are some several good books, plus there's another book on the Dow Pod not coming out, or supposedly is already out, that's a rewrite of Bryce Sudero's book. So there's a whole bunch of new research that's uh, going on out there about Price's Raid, and a lot of it's very good research, and I encourage you, to, if you're interested in this topic, to get all the books, especially mine, but all the books. <laughs> Like I said, Price's Raid, start, uh, the idea of it started in the summer of 64, 1864, and General Kirby Smith was the commander of the Trans-Mississippi, everything west of the Mississippi. He's not pictured here, because he didn't take part in the raid, so I don't care about it. Other than, he provided an interesting letter dated April 4th, asked, saying that Price, you're going to lead troops into Missouri, you're going to try and recruit men, you're going to try and get supplies, you're going to try and get um, ammunition, you're going to try and destroy everything you possibly can. Take St. Louis if you, poss if you think it's possible. And on your return, they want you to bring back all the woolen goods and other articles that may be needed for our army. Price had some objectives to the raid, despite what a lot of people say. Some people have argued that he didn't have any objectives. It was just go in, make a raid, hopefully you'll get out of there alive. There were objectives. It was one of the biggest raids in the Civil War's history, one of the biggest raids in the history of the United States at war. He entered Missouri on September 20th. And Sterling Price, if I get this right, is this gentleman up here. And I'm just going to, well, we can argue in front of this when I say, are there any questions? But generally, most people will say that he was a competent cavalry captain. Should have never made general, should have, you know, he was, but he was competent as a cavalry commander on the battlefield. He proved that at Iuka and Corinth and, and some other places, Lexington. But as far as a general, not really the best one we could have possibly picked. We got Joe Shelby, who Major James, uh, Major General Pleasanton claims after the war was, uh, U.S. Army, claims was the best cavalry Confederate general that they had. He's one of my favorites as far as Confederate generals go. And uh, in fact, I got that picture hanging in my office. He's very daring, and he has a good publicist. His adjutant writes glowing, wonderful reports of, I'm not going to say which ones, but of battles that never existed. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, Shelby got a lot of success and a lot of uh, play out of us, but he was an active, he was a fighting general. We have Marmaduke <coughs> and Fagan, who if I retire anytime soon, I'm actually considering of writing a combined bi biography of both of the men, just for the fact that they were together a lot in the Trans-Mississippi, fought in similar campaigns, and uh, both of them seem to have their issues with Price. Fagan apparently might have had a little bit of issues with the bottle, at least right before the battle pilot knob. And so, out of, but out of all this group, we have a West Point, uh, West Point general under, that's James Marmaduke, or John Marmaduke. We have a, we have James Fagan, who just recently showed his success down in, at Mark's Mill in Arkansas. And we have Shelby that, Back in 1863, the U.S. Army chased all through the state of Missouri and never could catch him. 
So we had the makings of a good rate. The problem was is that was the man in charge. <laughs> On September 20th, he enters the state of Missouri. Some people, and this is one of these wonderful argument things that I love to discuss over soda or anything stronger if I'm off duty. And everybody comes up with the number 12,000 men. If you go to the Fort Davidson State Historic Sites website, you have a database of Confederate officers that we've compiled over the years since 2000, since I started there. And we have 24,000 names for the entire, uh, of all the soldiers for the Confederates during the raid. At the end of the raid, you have the Confederates making the claim that Price brought back five to 7,000 recruits out of the state of Missouri. So if you subtract five to 7,000 off of 24,000, you get anywhere from 19 to, 19 to uh, 17,000 people possibly entering the state of Missouri. And if I threw out, let's say that I'm, t I'm wrong 10% of the time, some of those soldiers don't belong in there, knock off another 100, uh, 1,500 soldiers, we got well over 12,000 soldiers, at least in my mind, entering the state of Missouri on September 20th. It was mainly infantry, but they had enough ca uh, cavalry horses and that. Most of the men rode double. They always, they always talk about them being ragtag and, and didn't have shoes and didn't have clothes. And that's a good possibility, but way back then, people used to run around barefoot that couldn't afford shoes. And this is the middle of summer, folks. Uh, you don't need to have heavy blankets on and you all have to be marching through the, through the wonderful, mild weather that we have in Arkansas and the state of Missouri. Uh, today would be the exception. So Price enters Missouri with this group, comes to Fredericktown, and the story goes, and this is one reason why I like Doug's book, this book that I pointed out, is during our conversations, everybody says, and even our, even our website and our literature on site says that Joe Shelby convinced them that they are, tried to convince Price that he should not attack Pilot Knob, that he should go straight to St. Louis. And Doug is strongly of the opinion, and I pretty much have to agree with him at this point. All the evidence kind of leans to the fact that this story about Shelby saying that is something that his adjutant made up years later. It's Shelby probably what uh, Shelby was in Fredericktown, but he sent Shel uh, I'm sorry, Price was at Fredericktown. Shelby was sent out right away from Fredericktown to start going up through. Uh, Farmington and the Lead Belt and over to Potosi and blocking any Union soldiers from coming down to Pilot Knob. He was nowhere in the area when when Fagan and Marmaduke got together and said, oh yeah, we can attack, attack that fort. That's not a problem. So if he's nowhere around, he can't possibly be telling them don't attack the fort. So it's, it's just a piece of history that I think he's developed that is one of those things that maybe the story does need to be refreshed and rewritten after 150 years. I'm not gonna go through a lot of detail on the battle, but on September 26th, they enter the Arcadia Valley and start facing the Union troops there. Major James Wilson was the first soldier that was there. I don't have him pictured here, but he was the first one to engage the Confederates that was a commanding officer, he was the field officer, commanding officer of Pilot Knob at the time. And quickly thereafter, Major General, or Brigadier General Thomas Ewing came down from St. Louis to uh, be apprised of the situation. Now, who all, you're Missourians, who all knows the name Thomas Ewing Jr.? Okay, Thomas Ewing Jr was Sherman's brother-in-law. Everybody knows that Sherman said, war is hell, so he said it sometime after the war. This guy at the start of the war, or about middle of the war, said, war is not a benevolent institution. 
So uh, I somehow get the feel. And knowing some, having read through some of the letters in that, and some of the history of the family, uh, Tom was probably a little bit more well thought of than his other two brothers were by Sherman. Tom was with Sherman when he and Grant were discussing the march to the sea. So Tom was an ab not so much a strong abolitionist, but he was a, a Republican. He was an early Republican. He was more of a die in the hard Whig, um, die in the little Whig, if you could actually claim him, uh, call him something. And he became the first Supreme Court Justice of the state of Kansas. He also, uh, in later life, defended Dr. Uh, Samuel Mudd and several other Lincoln conspirators. His people were the only ones to get off without the death penalty. And he also defended President Andrew Johnston, Johnson, I'm sorry, he's all these Johnsons confused. Uh, Johnson, when it came time for Johnson to be impeached, he supported him in the public opinion, gave many speeches in support of the man. The other person that was at the Fort Davidson came in shortly after the first shots were fired was Colonel Thomas Fletcher, who was running for governor of the state of Missouri that fall. And he had already raised some troops. He had already been a prisoner at Libby Prison. He had done his share of fighting and he came back to Missouri and was asked to raise some more troops for the Union and was had just completed the process of raising the 47th Missouri Infantry. Mostly boys from the Ironton, Cuba, Missouri, uh, all the way up to Lincoln County, Missouri, but from, if you look from Lincoln County, kind of draw a line from there down to Wayne County, Missouri, uh, that's where he picked up most of his troops. He was leading a bunch of homeboys. The homeboys were fighting for their country. They were fighting for their houses. They were fighting for their family. They weren't in Gettysburg fighting over some battlefield that they'd never seen before. They were fighting for what was important to them. I don't go a lot into the battle on this. I will just say that tactically, Price made very few intelligent decisions <laughs> during the battle. One of the decisions that I think was intelligent, everybody, uh, but everybody kind of criticizes, and I do bring up in my book, it's, he let the Union escape. The Union troops just marched past a bunch of Confederate soldiers. How can that possibly be? And that's the way the story goes again, but if you actually sit down and think about it, how many Confederates that have just been shot at from a, in, from a fort would want to camp anywhere near that fort that night? <coughs> Not very many. So you're going to want to stay out of rifle and cannon range. Well, if you're staying out of rifle and cannon range, you're staying at least 800 yards away from the fort. And that puts the road that Ewing and his men escaped on well away, well out of the area where, they had, where the Confederates had their soldiers. Um, on the 27th, the Confederates attacked. Again, uh, Major Gifford, D uh, Doug, suggests that through all his evidence, everybody says there were three attacks. He believes that there was one big confused attack versus three separate attacks. And that's his new, his, that's his new evidence, and I can see where he's speaking about that. But the Confederates lost when the 20 minutes of fighting, 30 minutes of fighting was over, there were probably about 1,200 Confederates on the ground, either dead, wounded. And if you're asking for, uh, since everybody loves to get into numbers and how many was actually killed, especially since there was, this was touted by Ewing as 1,500 men were killed, or killed, wounded, you know, implying that a whole bunch of them were wounded. I actually think that there were probably only about 300, 350 Confederates that were out and out killed in the battle. 
and 1,500, 1,200 numbers possibly are right if we start, if we come up with the idea that wounded would be times four. And there were a lot of Confederates that were in the hospital that were buried later, uh, 30 days after the Union retook the area. So 300, 350 Confederates died probably outright or nearly outright, including the, I don't think I can get all the greats in there, but I think it was like great, great, great <clears throat> uncle of our current president of the United States. Who was fighting for the Confederates and is actually buried in our rifle pit. So uh, we had a lot, and, and a, a lot, if you look at a lot of the officers that were killed, they're all from his unit too. Uh, a lot, the majority of them. So in 20 minutes, we had this massive slaughter, and everybody kind of falls back. They talk about building ladder. Confederates building ladders during the night to take the fort the next day and different kind of things like that. And the Union says, aha, we're just going to walk out of the place and head north, which they kind of did. It, doesn't, it isn't as simple as it sounds. They did actually plan stuff, and they went so far as to what I would, in modern day terms, they sent shock troops into town to make darn sure that there were no Confederates anywhere near the area that they were going to escape to and took care of them. And then about one o'clock, two o'clock in the morning, they walked out of the fort. About another 35, 45 minutes later, the powder magazine was detonated. There was apparently four or five people still sleeping inside the fort when it was detonated. <laughs> uh, most of them kind of got surprised. A couple of them actually had to dig themselves out of being buried. But the magazine went off, and the, pro the race was then on as to what would happen next. Price didn't bother to chase them right away. Nobody suspected anything. Actually, everybody thought that the magazine blew up and took care of the Union troops, and everybody, or more or less everybody, was dead inside the fort. The Union troops got as far as Caledonia, Missouri, about 12 miles north when they started encountering some of Shelby's troops coming south to help Price take the fort the next day. They fought them, they found out that Price was in the, uh, I'm sorry, that Shelby was in the area, and instead of going and trying to attack Shelby, they took a left turn and went to Webster, Missouri, and then up through, up to Leesburg. Price's troops catch up with them a couple times on the retreat and have um, actually the toughest fight that one of the soldiers, uh, Sergeant Henry Wilkinson, claims to have been in, took place about a mile south of Leesburg. He actually considers that tougher fighting and more of a life and death struggle than pilot novels. And he called it the Battle of the Red Haw. And if you go into Leesburg, Missouri, and kind of, kind of and at the center of town, right before the railroad tracks, kind of head a little bit, start heading to the west again. So you make a right turn and kind of go back down that road. And if you see a road that would take you kind of down the uh, Merrimack River, make a left turn as soon as you can. It's in that general area where this battle took place. But there was a battle there. There was a battle right before that as they were crossing the Hooza. Union soldiers basically got to Leesburg, piled up a bunch of uh, made a makeshift fort near the railroad tracks, and were able to defend it until their relief arrived. Price and his army wasted basically four or five days chasing Thomas Ewing and his troops through the Missouri Ozarks for nothing, and then let them go when the reinforcement arrived. And Thomas Ewing and his troops then went on to Rolla and we'll talk about them a little, little bit more later. So Price is making mistakes from the start. Some people will claim that he made a mistake by not firing a lot of artillery into the fort. However, it's kind of been demonstrated that the firepower within the fort was more massive than the 
Confederates could have gotten on top of any mountains. And they had an expert artillerist inside the fort that could identify where cannon fire was coming from and fire at those cannons and, dis and actually did disable one. The only cannon that did anything that caused the Union any irritation is if you come to our battlefield nowadays and you go to the far east side, there's this creek down there. One of the Confederate cannons was in the creek. They load up their cannons, put their powder in, push the cannon up the side of the hill and just kind of lob shot into the fort. And every time they fire the cannon, the cannon would roll back down to the screen bed and then he'd come back down and load it up again. It's the only one that was effective because the Union could never figure out where they were firing from. They knew it was somewhere over there, they just couldn't figure out where and they couldn't get a good shot at them because they were buried, they were hidden by this creek. That's Fort Davidson up there, our model of it. It's our reenactment. On to that, and come on. Okay. I'll let you read over that while I keep talking. The, um, so some people claim that him not using cannons was a mistake. It may have been, I, don't, I really don't think so. I think that if he would have had a coordinated assault he could have taken the fort. The fort was not like Springfield, Missouri. In 1863, during the Battle of Springfield, Missouri, Springfield had a series of forts that were interconnected. And the uh, Marmaduke's troops, that, that included Shelby, never could really take all the forts. Came close to taking one, I think took one temporarily, but they got beaten back. Shelby even got wounded during those battles. It, was, it would have been a tough, it would have been tough if we, they would have had anything more than just that one little fort, but that's all they had. Price just did not take the time to plan his assault effectively and to time it effectively. So now, what happens is after the battle and the Union recovers and heads off from Leesburg, they head down to Rolla and they get to relax a little bit. Ewing gets a telegraph on the way down to Rolla that his wife just had twins. And they're in for some relaxation a little bit, at least a little bit of rest. They get to uh, the 47th Missouri and those soldiers with them get to man the stations at Rolla while the Rock troops that were in Rolla come up here to defend this city. And Price in the meantime spends some time raiding through Franklin County and attacking Herman, Missouri a little bit. And uh, some of his troops engage in uh, shooting some Union soldiers somewhere around Union, Missouri that were prisoners. And a couple different things like that. When they get to the Osage River, about where Highway 50's bridge is nowadays, there was a railroad bridge in that vicinity and there was a major battle there where one of Shelby's best commanders, uh, Colonel Shanks, gets injured. When Price finally gets into the area, though, he looks at all the fortifications there, and I think what happens is he sees, he remembers what little Fort Davidson did to his troops and to his attack, and sees the fortifications around Jefferson City and sees that he's now facing 10,000 troops in Jefferson City. I think that's the right number. Whereas he was only facing 1,000 down in Pilot Knob. And he decides that maybe it's in his best interest not to attack Jefferson City. So he moves on to Boonville, Missouri. And Boonville, being the Confederate capital of the state that it was, I mean, everybody loved him there. Um, they rally around him and uh, He's treated like a king, and he meets with some of the local bushwhackers. Shelby goes up into, uh, Shelby and Marmaduke go up to Glasgow, Missouri, and attack Glasgow and say, hey, they got a whole bunch of supplies up here, and look at all these neat blue uniforms, and let's pass them out to the troops. Then after that, they um, move off toward Jefferson City, uh, toward Kansas City, and by that time, General Rosecrans, who I've, Probably should include a picture in here at some point too, but 
General Rosecrans comes up with the, uh, uh, finally starts moving and finally starts getting soldiers that are moving after Price. However, the orders he's given them is basically just push them. Never really attack them, just push them. So you have General A.J. Smith chasing Price, never really getting anywhere to where that they can do real good battle. When you get over to Lexington, Missouri, you have a very big cavalry battle just south of town that the, uh, some of the Kansas troops and uh, federal troops from Kansas engage in. And from that point on, it's just kind of a pushing match where the Union troops are being pushed back by the Confederate troops and engaging the Confederate troops and falling back until they get to Westport. At Westport, you have an all out and out battle. There's no real clear cut winner, but you have the largest cavalry battle west of the Mississippi. And then, I believe it's the next, next day, troop prices in retreat. He's down around Mine Creek, Kansas. They're trying to get across this little ford. And as they're crossing this ford, you have some people show up. One of them is uh, Colonel Benteen. And Colonel Benteen, Frederick Benteen, you might know was one of the people that was, uh, if you know the general, if you know any of the stories about General Custer, Benteen uh, is involved with Custer later during the Indian Wars. But anyhow, at Westport, I'm sorry, at Mine Creek, as they're trying to cross this creek with all these wagons and all that, Price lets the wagons go first. He wants to protect the wagons. And being the smart organizer he is, he says, I'm gonna put my bravest, strongest, smartest troops in charge of the wagon train. So Shelby's been getting across the river first. So they're well out of the way when the Union cavalry shows up. Ben Teen and some uh, other soldiers, I think the name of one of the people is Phillips, attack the Confederates there. They capture a whole bunch of them. They execute a whole bunch of them. Execute them because they're all wearing blue uniforms. Rosencrantz had already sent out orders that anybody in a blue uniform is to be treated as a spy. So there's a large amount of executions there of Confederate soldiers. There's a large amount that are captured, including General Marmaduke and, and later General Cavalli. He wasn't a general quite then. Plus several of the current other colonels in the Confederate Army. Fagan gets away. Just barely. So, and then they end up burning half the wagons before, I believe it's like half the wagons before they get down to the bottom of the state. The troop, you get the Union pushing Price after that, but never really fully engaging them. Because nobody wanted to give the order to engage them. Until you got General Blunt, James Blunt from Kansas finally decided that somebody needs to do something. And, and the one thing I'll say about Blunt, he didn't mind attacking people. He didn't mind making love and drinking and, and, and having wild parties either, but he also didn't mind attacking people. And he decided to attack Price at Newtonia, and Shelby was the rear guard then, and again, Shelby uh, beat him up. If Shelby had been the rear guard at Mine Creek, Mine Creek might have ended up different. Okay, so that's kind of a general overall of, of, the, uh, of the raid. And I'd like to cover some of the successes and failures of the raid. And since I can't get in front of these speakers, I'm going to have to, my wife hates it and I hate it if I read a lot of stuff, but read a little bit of stuff. It was the lar largest cavalry raid launched by the Confederacy. Now you have modern day historians like Albert Castile that say that it was only a minor blurb, blurb on the radar screen of the Civil War, that nothing it didn't really amount to much. But then you got others like Robert Shallop that say that it pulled troops from other places. I firmly believe that it pulled sufficient number of troops from other places, that it did, did cause a disruption to the Union plans of the Civil War. You have General A.J. Smith, who's supposed to be heading toward Nashville, who's supposed to be being backup support for General Sherman's march into, well, 
Sherman had just taken Atlanta for Sherman's march to the sea. So he's supposed to be supplying fresh troops along the way down there. All of a sudden, he's told to sidetrack into little old Missouri and chase this guy around for 45 days. And he does. Never really engages him because he's not ordered to engage him. So you got troops that should have been elsewhere that we didn't get any, uh, that weren't there being used to their fullest potential. You have General Canby down in Mississippi, who was supposed to be one of the people that was starting to work on the attack of Mobile, Alabama. And he has to stop what he's doing and go into Arkansas. You have Steele in Arkansas, who is supposed to be chasing Shelby, actually does, I think, chase, uh, send one of his generals forward, and the general actually does eventually make it into Missouri at some point, um, well after Shel uh, Price is nowhere near it. And, he, but, and Steele was just, still just was, didn't do a lot of good during the, that raid. I mean, he just didn't do any good. So you have all these troops that are moving around and being pulled from other theaters. If Mobile had been taken on when it was supposed to have been, it was supposed to have been, the, the attack on Mobile, Alabama was supposed to have started in November. It started in April of 65. Some historians say that was the decisive battle that finally laid, put the last nail in the Confederate coffin. Well, if you're gonna say that, and it, and it was supposed to start in November, but didn't start until April, you got five months of delay. What caused that delay? And one of the arguments can easily be Sterling Price is right. You have Confederate, uh, I mentioned Confederates in other theaters. Of all the Confederates in other theaters that know of Price's raid, <coughs> only two take advantage of Price's raid. If you were going to have Price raid into Missouri with the idea to really disrupt federal plans, Lee should have been attacking, he wasn't. Some of these other, Johnston should have been attacking, he wasn't. The only two people that felt like attacking anybody were General Hood, and this guy called Nathan Bedford Forrest, who my former boss actually thinks is the best Confederate cavalry officer, and I throw Shelby in his face. So we kind of get into a little discussions about that one. Hood attacked Schofield, General Schofield at Springfield, Tennessee, and he could have moved, uh, and he should have been moving past. Hood <coughs> forced Schofield to risk battle there. Schofield had to fight a delay going all the way into Nashville. A.J. Smith's troops just barely arrived at Nashville prior to the attack on the city. 10,000 troops, I think, did make some of the difference at that particular battle. So you have now prices rate causing disruptions not only in Missouri, but in Tennessee, Mississippi, and it probably would have gone all over the whole South except for the fact that you had a lot of the Confederate commanders just didn't take advantage of it. There was enough concern over the fact that Price was doing this, that Sherman, who was supposed to start his attack and go to the sea, almost immediately after Atlanta, 30 days after, I think it was like no, first of November, he was supposed to take off and for his march to the sea. That got delayed until all this stuff was settled out. So again, Another thing that everybody points to and says, when Sherman marched to the sea and marched, in, marched into South Carolina and did all that stuff, that's one of the things that really caused the uh, Confederacy finally to fall. Again, we're talking about it being delayed because of Sterling Price. Uh, Sterling Price also did, cons uh, one of the things that he was successful about is he did cons conscript a large number of soldiers for the Confederacy. <laughs> Uh, the one book that I have over here is, and I'll just talk about it for a minute, uh, General Sterling Price's Great Missouri Raid is all, are all newspaper articles 
from the Missouri Daily Democrat. From September through January of 1865 to talk about the raid. The only reason that I ever bothered editing this and wearing out my eyes looking at this real fine microfilm print that nobody can read was Rice Sudero and I have been trying to compile lists of prisoners taken at Pilot Knob and other places during Price's raid. And the more he and I talked about it, it was like, well, if I'm going to compile all these lists, all I got to do is throw in a whole bunch of extra articles, and, uh, newspaper articles from these lists, and I now have a book. Because, and so if you go to this book here, if you're interested in genealogy, we have a, it's also available on CD here. Because you can type in the name John Smith and get every reference to John Smith pop up. Shelley, same thing. So you got all these different articles, and it's a nice little bedtime read. I, you know, there's some articles that are only three inches long. There's some that are a couple pages, but nothing's more usually than three, four, or five pages long. But the idea, that book started as a genealogical research. And basically one time when my wife was sick, I just started saying, well, I'll start transcribing some of the other stuff just to kind of kill time while I'm sitting here kind of keeping an eye on her, and that's what, kind of what happened. So very interesting for that part. The prices conscripts you got a lot of men in, that are in those newspaper articles especially from Howard County for some reason that are whining because they claim that they weren't that they were conscripted by Price and that they weren't really Confederate soldiers that they had been forced to be Confederate soldiers but then you have other people saying, oh no, they always wanted to be Confederate soldiers and they waved in and greeted them as they walked in and signed right up for them. So uh, some of the supposed conscripts were ended up being treated just like uh, the regular soldiers and marched over to Albany. You have, uh, like I said, Major Shallow reported that there were five to 7,000 conscripts that were taken. One of the biggest failures early on in the raid, or what ended up being a real big failure, was when Price entered the state of Missouri, the Confederates, the Oaks, the Order of American Knights, was supposed to make a, give out a press release saying, now is it, you know, your salvation is at, hot, top, at hand, raise, rise up, defeat the federal peoples, come to the banner of Sterling Price, join his troops and all that. The guy that was supposed to write that was out of town. That's the way things go. If it had been written on the 20th and actually published in the newspapers on the 20th, he might have actually started getting a bunch of conscripts before the battle piled not. He was, it wasn't, it wasn't published till a while later. I think at least, I think it was almost 10 days later that before it was finally published. By then the battle piled not was already known he had already lost a bunch of troops, and who wants to get shot at and beaten up that badly to be in the front lines with uh, all that bloodshed going on when you got this, uh, the Federals basically kicking his butt. So if it had been done earlier, if it had been done on the 20th like it was supposed to, he might have actually raised more volunteers to come to his aid. Am I about done with this? Yep. So for those reasons, Dave and I and Bruce all firmly are of the opinion that Price probably did extend the raid, or did extend the length of the Civil War, somewhere in the area of four months, five months, somewhere like that. Okay, some of the failures of Price's raid, when you talk of Price's raid, I mentioned the Oaks already. There were three major battles lost, Pilot Knob, uh, Westport and Mine Creek, and really the victory battles never were decisive victories. They were kind of uh, just delaying. You know, he won. He was able to keep his goods and and retreat out of the area or move on from the area. The um, he failed to attack and take a major city. Closest he got to St. Louis, from the reports I get, is somewhere outside Kirkwood, Missouri, which. While Kirkwood is a very populous area nowadays, there's a lot of farms out there then. You had to go down to, you had to go down to within probably 15 blocks of the 
Mississippi River to actually get a populated area. Price, in his own mind, hoped to influence the elections of 1864. If he had been successful and had been able to extend his stay in Missouri up to the November elections, the United States, or the United States could have ended up having a President McClellan because as much as we love Lincoln nowadays, Lincoln wasn't necessarily loved that much until after he was dead back then. A lot of people didn't like him in his own party. A lot of people didn't like him in the Democratic Party. All it would have taken is for Sherman to have suffered a major defeat, Grant to have suffered a major defeat, or for Sterling Price to come in here and say, I've just liberated Missouri. It's now in Confederate hands. So if he, would, if he would have been able to do that, we might have been looking at a President McClellan. McClellan was more interested in suing for peace than fighting it to a conclusion where um, you had a United States again. We might, have, to this day, still have a Confederate States of America if McClellan had gotten in. So he did hope to influence the elections. Mine Creek occurred on October 25th and 6th. 25th, I'll say 25th. I'll stick to that story too. Um, happened on October 25th, about a week before election. Everybody knew that Price was not going to stay in Missouri pretty much after that. The battle was over. All the prisoner stories were coming in. All the generals that were captured were being processed through. Stories about the generals and their captivity were going across the national wires. Everybody knew that Price had been defeated. So you got Sherman getting ready to march to the sea, still in control of Atlanta. You got Grant at Petersburg, and you got Price limping out of Missouri. Did I say Missouri right, babe? Mm -hmm. Okay, sometimes? Okay. We have this, I, I, I say I'm kind of like former Governor Kit Bond. I, he interchanged Missouri and Missouri, and I feel that if it's good enough for him, it's good enough for me. Um, we did have one other issue, and that's that it, the battle did raise a black flag over in Missouri with the Wilson Massacre. You had the Union won in retaliation. Uh, Mine Creek just gave them a chance to partially <coughs> retaliate against any Confederate that was in a blue uniform uh, versus trying to capture prisoners. So, did Price's raid accomplish anything? I think that strategically, I think he did extend the war. I think he did uh, accomplish a lot of stuff that he probably didn't really plan to accomplish, but he did accomplish it. I don't think that he could have imagined pulling, I'm gonna estimate 25,000 troops out of other areas just to come back here into Missouri and to fight him. That's a lot of troops. Plus all the people in St. Louis that St. Louis was not prepared. They had to enlist almost every able-bodied man, and they just started that around the middle of September and getting them under, in, under, under orders. So you had a lot of, you had a disrupting uh, railroad traffic and everything else inside the state of Missouri. So you had that, you had all the damage that he did to different bridges and that. He destroyed the bridge out at the Osage River. The one, pro and he, they destroyed a whole bunch of uh, bridges along the Iron Mountain Rail Road. The only thing that was different in 64, when, when, he claims that he, when he claims that he destroyed millions of dollars worth of property, especially railroad property, in 1864, the Union had gotten to the point where, okay, we're used to this destroying stuff thing. We know that they're gonna burn bridges, so what are we gonna do? Well, we're gonna pre-assemble some. And, so a bridge that would have been destroyed in 1861 by Confederates in the state of Missouri that might have been destroyed and out of service for six months, now within a matter of weeks is up and running again in, uh, in 1864. So the lasting effects for that type of stuff wasn't too long. So more or less in conclusion, before I open it up for questions, I'm just gonna say that I think strategically he was more of a success than a lot of people give him credit for. 
Tactically, he was a disaster. He, I don't think, ever gave a order that was <coughs> a cogent order throughout almost any battle that we had. I think that he was disconnected from it. Um, I, I know that Marmaduke, the night after the Battle of Pilot Knob, did not want, you know, Price says, oh, come on down to my tent. Marmaduke was basically, oh, I got other stuff I need to do. And I think, I think, and that's where the stories of Fagan also coming in and having a little bit too much to drink come in. And well, he, he didn't go down to Price's tent either. There was enough disagreement in the command staff of the Confederacy, uh, Confederate troops in Missouri, that they just didn't, they just weren't successful in getting their act together and planning stuff the way it should have been planned. Pilot Knob could have been taken. It wasn't. And so we go back to that question. I'll tell you right now, that's a stretch. But I'm going to argue this, and I'm going to leave you with this thought. General Thomas Ewing was one of the, was the general here at the battle. If he had died during the battle, what things did he do that might have been, or what things did he do that could have possibly turned out differently? And I'm going to argue one thing. He was a strong, ardent supporter of Andrew Johnson. And General Blunt one night is walking through the streets of Washington while the Johnson impeachment is going on. And here's Ewing giving a speech. And Blunt's basic opinion was, was it wouldn't, you know, the man is speaking so much from the heart and so forcefully that there could be a rebellion against Congress if all he did that during the speech was asked for. So Ewing was a very Ewing was very much on the president's side. He thought the president was wrong on a lot of stuff, but he was on the president's side. He was very much a believer in uh, the president's seat, if not the president. But I'll argue this. Who was the deciding vote in Congress that saved Johnson from being impeached? Anybody? It was a Kansas senator named Edmund Ross, prior to the war, newspaper publisher. Um, he was the one deciding vote. There was a couple others. But it basically probably came down to him. Edmund Ross was a captain in the 11th Kansas Cavalry before, or during the war, I'm sorry. His boss in the 11th Kansas was General Thomas Ewing. General Thomas Ewing, during the impeachment proceedings, even though there's no smoking gun, Everybody else was out whining and dining Ross and trying to get him to vote their way. Everybody. Ben Butler, uh, Wade, everybody was, you know, we want you to vote. You know, you need to vote the way we tell you to do. And Ross was leaning that way. He was a radical Republican. He did not like Johnson. But he was a good friend of Tom Ewing who even in the 1890s told Tom Ewing that he always uh, appreciated his thoughts and support on everything that he's ever, that they ever engaged in. It's my belief that Tom Ewing influenced Ross's vote. It's not only my belief. Uh, the mayor of Leavenworth, Kansas, uh, Daniel Anthony, Susan B. Anthony's brother, sent a telegram right after, right after the vote to Ross saying that your vote is dictated by Ewing and by his, uh, oh, I forgot what, but basically by Ewing's interests and cursing him. 
I do believe Ewing got to Edmund Ross. So the question is, is we've never had a successful impeachment of the United States. If Ewing didn't get to Ross, and if I'm right, Ewing got to Ross and saved that, if it had been the reverse, how many other presidents that weren't liked by Congress from 1865 all the way up to Clinton, who they tried to impeach, might have ended up being affected by that? How many would we have had a strong, as strong a presidency as we had? And what kind of America would we have because of that? So I do think that there was an influence in American history that the Battle of Pilot Knob did have. If Ewing would have been captured or killed, or captured and eventually killed, because a lot of people didn't like him because of order number 11 on the west side of the state, it might have ended up, ended up differently. So that's just my thought. Do I think it made a big issue? Do I think it is something that we need to make a monument to Ewing at Pilot Knob over and, uh, and make it a national historic site? It'd get me a better retirement, but that'd probably be not good. <laughs> so that's my speech for tonight. And I'll open it up to questions and have at it. Please. Yes, sir. Why didn't Price just put his army on the Iron Mountain Railroad and in a couple hours be in the middle of St. Louis? Well, and this goes back to tactics. He, uh, the Iron Mountain Railroad, the last railroad train to get out of Pilot Knob, Ewing had gotten out of Pilot Knob, so there wasn't an immediate railroad train in the area, number one. Number two, part of his tactical thinking is, is I'm gonna send Sh uh, Shelby up to Potosi and on the way he's gonna destroy all these bridges. So the bridges were destroyed and he couldn't have easily gotten into, and they were destroyed all the way up to at least um, Victoria, eventually up to Victoria, Missouri, which is just a little bit north of the Soto. So they would not have had an easy uh, way to get in that way. Um, I don't think that he could have gotten into St. Louis as easily because A.J. Smith's units were between Shelby and St. Louis. So I just don't think that, it would, I, I don't think it was too practical. And considering that Smith had somewhere around 8, 10,000 men, I don't think Price would have attacked that large number of men so immediately after the battle, the pilot hunt. Yes, sir. Do you give any credence to the theory that uh he might have surrendered Pilot Knob, but he was under all the pressure from the bad press of Order Number Eleven. He didn't want he didn't want to be defeated, you know, there because he ripped half the western side of the state just to scorch your policy over there. No, because I didn't. And I wonder about your thoughts. Okay. Uh, uh, right away, I'd say no, and I, the reason why is. Uh, and that, I didn't bring my book on Ewing here tonight because that was another book I wrote. But he was never taken to task in the state of Kansas or the state of Ohio, which were the two states that he always ran for office in. Never taken to task for anything about Order Number 11. In fact, most in Ohio, if you read the newspaper accounts, he didn't lose because of Bingham's painting. That's, that's cock and bull story. Um, he lost because there were too many people running for the office of governor and he couldn't garner enough votes against the Republican. But the, the, but the main thing is, is that the Democrat, I'm sorry, the Republicans that were running didn't want to use order number 11 against them because Missourians uh, were for a term that would have been used earlier before the war were just a bunch of pukes. And not only that, they were Democratic pukes. And so basically, we're, you know, we as the Republican Party are going to go against this guy who took care of a bunch of Democrats for us. <laughs> and they just considered it, you know, that it was a, not a really good winning situation for them. So they stayed away from him. And like I said, he just got beat, he, he, he just got beat because of other issues. And part of my, I honestly do think that if he would have stayed in the state of Kansas, 
He very possibly could have ended up being a senator for the state of Kansas, but other issues, other family issues or whatever made him not stay after. Other family issues and um, initially he thought James Lane was gonna live longer than he did and when he wouldn't stand a chance of ever gaining Lane's uh, friendship ever again, so. But you came from St. Louis to Mount Yes, sir. He was the in charge of the district of St. Louis under Rosecrans, William Rosecrans, who was in charge of the Department of Missouri. Was this after Rosecrans' uh, failure at uh, Fort Tennessee? Yes. And Grant took him to task for this quite a bit too. Tell us about the Wilson massacre. Well, actually, okay. Why did you see one of my slides that? I actually got, <clears throat> see this is from a old uh, slide that I got. There's several things written on the Wilson massacre and there's a nice statue up in the Riverview Cemetery in Louisiana, Missouri that has several of the names of the people that were killed in the massacre engraved on it. <clears throat> and these are the two main people. The, the story goes, and I could really get in trouble on this one. I could really get in trouble. I shall suffice it to say that some people will argue that Major Wilson massacred a bunch of Major Tim Reeves's troops on Christmas Day at Pulliam Springs. And... Uh, Basically, because Major Reeves had Major Reeves's units had captured a bunch of Wilson soldiers down in Centerville, Missouri, took them off as prisoners, and Wilson was outraged, really ticked off at his <coughs> subordinates for being caught, and caught up with Reeves at Pulliam Springs. Did have a surprise attack. Did attack a bunch of people. Did attack the group that was sitting down to have dinner and ended up taking his prisoners back, Reeves ran away. The interesting thing that I found is that, or the interesting thing that I think is, while everybody says there was a massacre, we know that there were a whole bunch of soldiers brought in afterwards. We've got Lou Weimer, who is a historian down in the West Plains, Missouri area, and uh, has a letter that basically says that they brought in approximately, I think it was 100 prisoners into uh, uh, Middlebrook, Missouri, which is just north of uh, Pilot Knob. And that a lot of them were wounded, but a lot of them, were, uh, a lot of them weren't wounded from this raid, from this supposed massacre. And I just really can't believe that there's a massacre where you leave over 100 witnesses. Anyhow, uh, during the Battle of Pilot Knob, Major Wilson is one of the first ones that is doing a lot of fighting. He gets injured early on. He's wounded with uh, having a bullet graze his head, a mini ball graze his head. And right before the battle, he's fighting on the side of Pilot Knob Mountain near the Iron Furnace. And he's finally, uh, his troops are finally overrun and he's captured. And they take a bunch of stuff. They take his, uh, some of his uniforms, take some of his papers, take his boots, do all that stuff, and march him up to Union, Missouri area, him and several other of the soldiers that were captured in the battle. And at one point, Reeves, now they have, Reeves and Wilson were on opposite sides in a local war. So there was no, you know, we don't have to, pretend that there was a massacre for there to be any love loss between these two guys. They were always fighting. Or parts of their groups were always fighting. But anyhow, Tim, the story goes that Tim Reeves asked for members of the 3rd Missouri State Militia Cavalry to step forward. Now Wilson had to step forward, he was known. One of the men that was in the 3rd was told to play dumb and didn't uh, step forward and he was saved. Uh, another man that thought that he would just be let go to, 
said that he was in the third and really wasn't. So he stepped forward and ended up getting shot. But they basically got, took him out, shot him, and uh, threw just enough of dirt over him for the pigs to be able to find him and eat him up. And uh, not too long after the battle, about mid-October, the uh, Union Command finds the bodies. They bring them into St. Louis. They identify the bodies. They have Captain Dinger, uh, Franz Dinger, who was from Ironton, uh, identify the body and give statements as to what happened. And that's how we know the story of who, how they were called out in that. And so Wilson is buried. Some people say that he wasn't buried <coughs> under this monument that is in the Old Troy Cemetery. But the articles that I found indicate that he he was either buried there or buried near there. And one of the interesting things about his memorial that's posted there is his memorial is probably the only real reason we've got a picture drawn by an artist of the battle. Because the picture that was drawn of the artist when the Union soldiers found out about it and they thought that William Henchy might be a little bit of a Confederate sympathizer, he was strongly encouraged to complete his picture and to offer it for sale so that they could raise funds for the monument of Wilson. So that's about all I can say without getting in a lot of trouble because there are a lot of different people that have argued this on various sides. And um, I guess I started out this evening saying I see things from a union perspective. And I just don't really believe there was a massacre. Was a couple soldiers that were supposedly at Pilot Knob, Confederate, and never did. Well, didn't have the money to buy that picture from the site, so we didn't get it. Just any other questions? Don't forget yes. to talk about your reenactment. Well, I won't. And there's one in Centralia this weekend. Well. Well, there's a whole bunch of reenactments coming up. Yes, there is. I've got some uh, flyers here. I don't, it almost looks like there might actually be 100 people in this room. I don't think I grabbed 100, but these are the flyers for, for the reenactment. And it gives, uh, we're starting out on September 20th, the Saturday before our battle with uh, Ms. Lee and the Humdingers playing a blues concert, followed by the St. Louis Levy Band doing a little bit of Dixieland down there on the battlefield. And then we have some uh, different events, mostly music, some theater. Uh, Thursday evening is one of our local experts talking about collecting Civil War artifacts. You know, he's gonna bring several of his things and that he's dug up at different places and talk about how he evaluates the quality of different, uh, different things when he buys things. And uh, then on the Saturday and Sunday, we got the battle coming up. So we have these wonderful, you, have, you can certainly take these. We also got a couple, again, I was planning for, okay, there'll probably be about 20, 30 people here. Uh, we have some brochures that just came out from our historical society and and Chamber of Commerce, we have a driving tour of the valley and markers set up throughout the valley so that if you want to, you can actually follow the troop movements through the whole valley all the way up to Pilot Knob. And there's a couple that, as you leave Pilot, as you leave the battlefield, uh, heading north on the Caledonia Road. So they've just republished that and they've added a whole bunch of information. The Arcadia Valley is also known as the place where Grant received his Brigadier General's star. And even though he knew about it ahead of time, official word came to him in Ironton, and there's a monument to him there. And while we don't, while the area doesn't have a lot of Civil War stuff that's still surviving, the courthouse is still there, and it has a cannonball scar on it still. Uh, not, not as dramatic as Lexington, so I'll, I'll give them that. And uh, Emanuel Lutheran Church that was a Union hospital uh, during the battle is really well preserved for a 
still active congregation, basically because they could never afford to do anything else. So um, you, I, it's been several years since I've been in there, but last time I was in there, you could still see some of the blood on the floor. So, anything else? Yes, ma'am. And how many reenactors are you expecting for the Battle of Pilot Mob? The biggest reenactment I've ever had was 750. We've got 1,450 already registered. Wow. We have a son who lives in St. Louis, but he's working in El Paso, and he's coming back for that. And his, his son, a grandson, also participates. We have, uh, we have almost 100 coming from Texas, my understanding. Wow. We got them coming from Pennsylvania and Maine and uh, Texas. And I think the other place farther west is uh, South Dakota. So, I mean, we've got them coming from all over. We have a, a lot of settlers. I fully anticipate in our 40 acre field, 45 acre field, we're gonna, besides all the reenactors, we're gonna have 30,000 people on Saturday. Wow. Anything else? Well, hang around if you don't have, if you have a question and you just wanna ask me in private, so thank you very much.